All right. Uh, more pending? Just a second. All right, so our recording has started. Uh, well, welcome to the session. Uh, we are going to be talking about some psychological perspectives on racism, in particular in the uh, context of America. So racism is by no means unique to the United States, uh, but it does have a special and long history in the United States. And of course, it's going to be most relevant to us, so who are who are members uh, of, of this community and are experiencing these sort of things on a daily basis. So that's the plan. Um, our talk's going to be based on a uh, very recent article that was uh, written by Stephen Roberts and Michael Rizzo. So this is uh, titled The Psychology of American Racism. It's in one of the premier journals in psychology, American Psychologist. And in this article, they outline seven um, sort of basic principles or factors that contribute in, in very significant ways to racism in America. These are by no means the only things that contribute to racism in America, but there are some of the big ones, right? And so uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit, talk about some of the psychological research behind these different processes uh, to try to get a handle on what psychology can kind of tell us about the factors that are contributing to the racism we see in American society today. So to start with, uh, let's get a definition out there. So in the context of our talk today, we're talking about racism as a system of advantage based on race that is created and maintained by an interplay between two things. One of those is psychological factors. So this is the way that we think about things, the way we feel about things and our actions, as well as kind of at a bigger perspective or kind of up a level, sociopolitical factors, right? So we can have laws, we can have policies, we can have institutions that all lead to the end result of racism and racist behavior. So we're talking about racism in the sort of systemic perspective, right? And that's something important to keep in mind because you can talk about racism at like an individual level, right? Someone having racist attitudes or beliefs or feelings, um, but it's more than that, right? We have, uh, we, we exist in a society that has certain structures in place and certain processes that end up uh, leading to racist uh, activities and racism at a large scale that continues to be perpetuated. So we're gonna take a look at that and the factors that contribute to it. So uh, I mentioned we're talking about American racism. Um, one, one sort of uh, way to think about this is we're not just looking at those individual actions. We're talking about something that's kind of knit into the fabric of society at a very basic level. So uh, this is actually a protest flag that was put up at a baseball game, noting that racism is, is, is as American as baseball. And uh, if we look historically, that, that rings kind of true, right? It's been around since the beginning, since before the beginning of this country. So. Let's talk about these seven factors that are identified in that article that contribute to American racism. So those seven factors are categories, uh, two is factions, three is segregation, four is hierarchy, five is power, six is media, and seven is passivism. So we'll take a look at each of these. And again, these are not the only things that contribute to racism in America, but these are some big factors and they're factors that we especially have a, a, an understanding of from a psychological perspective. So let's get started with the first one. Uh, number one is categories. Uh, categories is just referring to the idea that we, in many ways, automatically arrange people into distinct groups. Um, this is something that is natural in a sense that we, this is part of how we understand the world. Um, and it has some important consequences for us, right? So when we think about people as being members of particular groups, and when we categorize things, we are making distinctions. We're saying this group or this category is different. It is not like this other category. Uh, and in the case of, of racism, we're categorizing people based on this arbitrary difference in pigmentation of our skin, right? So the downstream consequences of that, like why it matters, is when we start thinking about things in terms of categories, we also tend to start thinking about things in essentialist and normative terms. So the essentialist aspect of this is the idea that when we have a category, we define it in a particular way, right? Uh, if you, If I ask you to tell me how dogs are different from cats, you're going to try to explain like, well, like dogs are like this and cats are like this, but often you end up with the idea that at the end of the day, there's some essential thing that makes a dog a dog and makes a cat a cat, and they're just different, right? And that thinking comes from that categorization. So if I have you thinking in terms of cats versus dogs, you're going to interpret and understand things differently than if I have you think in terms of mammals or just animals. If you're thinking in that respect, those differences are no longer relevant, right? And you're not gonna be thinking of, 
something having essential qualities that make it different and distinct from others. Uh, the normative reason part is the notion that when we have this idea of categories, um, we, we have that uh, sometimes very clear sense of what characterizes a group, how that category is defined, and that tends to step over into not just describing people or things or objects, whatever we're categorizing, but it gives us a sense of how things should be, right? You sort of see this when uh, someone makes a, a new piece of art or there, there's something that, that sort of disrupts an industry, right? It's different. It's not normal. It's not the way things should be. And that way of thinking kind of comes really naturally when we think of things in terms of categories, uh, categories, right? We think of them as having particular features and something that doesn't have those features, that doesn't fit in with our expectations, we, we see as being wrong. Right? We actually see that as a bad thing uh, because we think in such categorical terms. So I mentioned we can sort of think of uh, racism broadly as something that's really knit into the fabric uh, of our country. This is in many ways uh, evident at this sort of category level in something as simple as the census, right? So basically since the beginning of the country, we, we've been some of the most fundamental questions we ask to understand who is in this country, who are the citizens uh, of, of the United States. Um, the questions we ask include race, right? Uh, so this is the most recent census, uh, like dem it's a demonstration copy of the questions you would potentially be asked to answer. Um, it, it looked a little different if you completed this online for like the previous census, but uh, they're, they're now asking if you were to indicate you are white to explain a little more, right? So include elements of ethnicity and things like that. But this distinction between black and white really is codified in the way that our country counts its citizens, right? And if we look historically, this figure goes back uh, all the way to some of our first censuses. So back in 1790, the categories were free white females and males, slaves, and all other free persons, right? That distinction uh, and in this case, it's going to be largely a racial distinction at, at that point in history, has been there all along. And we continue having those categories. If anything, these categories have only expanded since then, right? So we, we, can't, we can't really get away from it. it. It's baked into the way we think about these sort of things. So that idea of categorizing comes very naturally to people. It's how we make sense of the world. If you couldn't think in terms of categories, it would be really hard to navigate your daily life, right? If you couldn't understand, if you're driving down the road, that all those other things that are on the road with you are also cars or vehicles, it'd be pretty hard, right? You can't think of things in terms of everything being a unique, totally different thing, and you have to learn from scratch. We use categories to make sense of things. So it's something that naturally happens, but when it's applied to this context of racial differences, it leads to perpetuate these sort of beliefs about what things are, how we define those, that they have essential characteristics, and that turns into how we think things should be. So our next factor is factions. So we have these categories, uh, and some of the categories we can think about have to do with people, right? We can have different factions among people, and this is another thing that humans are really good at. We tend to uh, favor our in-group. So this is just the other people who belong to the same group that we identify with, the same category that we identify with. And we tend to have more negative feelings towards people who are part of the out-group. You can see this all over the place, right? So it's not just in terms of race. You see this in sports, right? Like our team versus their team, like us versus them, literally is how we talk about those sort of things. Um, and when we experience those sort of categories and we have our in-group and we have our out-group, you tend to have positive perceptions of your in-group, right? The people that you are that you consider to be similar or the same as you. And people who are in your in-group, you have this built-in assumption that, hey, we're working together. We're going to cooperate. I need to trust you. Uh, I'm going to support you. You're going to support me. And this comes automatically with the territory. If you're thinking of someone as part of your in-group, you automatically are going to have more favorable, favorable thoughts to them. And we're going to see out-group members as potential competition right? They're, they're the enemy, and we're automatically going to have more negative perceptions of them. And what's really fascinating from a psychological perspective is just how easily this can happen. So the minimal groups paradigm that's mentioned at the end of this slide um, is a really good way to demonstrate just how easily you can create these factions out of thin air. So if I were to show you this slide, which I guess I'm doing, um, if you had to guess how many dots 
do you think are in that image? You, you don't have to type it in or anything, but just keep in your mind how many dots would you say are in that image? Um, and what you do in a study is you have people estimate how many dots they see. And after you tell me how many dots you see, I give you a little bit of feedback. I say, OK, well, so you're an overestimator. Um, and in this case, there are actually 150 dots. But in reality, it doesn't matter how many dots there are. I can just tell you that you're an overestimator. You're not really going to know whether you were really an overestimator or not. And I can say, all right, all the overestimators, you go over there. You're in your own group. And everyone who underestimated how many dots there are, you go over there. You're in your own group. And it's a very arbitrary thing, right? It's, it's a bunch of dots. It's, we're guessing how many dots there are. And it really doesn't tell you anything about who that person is. And yet, if we categorize people based on that, people will very, very quickly develop that in-group, out-group bias, right? You can bring a bunch of strangers in to an experiment, randomly assign them to different groups, right? Because some are overestimating, some are underestimating, which they're not. You can make that up. It doesn't matter. And very quickly, they will start telling you how those the overestimators who are my group well, we're obviously smarter um, and we, we're, we're friendlier, we're kinder, we have all these positive characteristics. And those people in that group, the underestimators, oh, they're just, they're kind of mean people and they're bitter and uh, like they're just, they, they feel bad about how terrible they did. And like you have negative perceptions that come from something so simple as this arbitrary distinction. Um, another example of this minimal groups paradigm is show people a couple pieces of art. Uh, so these are paintings from Bauhaus artists and uh, you, you see, you ask them like, which, which of these do you prefer? which is a pretty arbitrary thing, right? These are intentionally pieces of art that like they don't have like the clear sort of structure. These aren't portraits of people in like a traditional sense, right? So your preference doesn't really tell us anything about you. It's just a just a preference that you have. Um, but if we separate people based on those groups, they will very quickly begin to say like, oh, like, well, we're the people who chose the Kandinsky painting. And obviously we have better taste because that's just clearly it's better art. I don't know what those other people are thinking. And you begin to favor your in-group and disfavor the out-group. It, it happens so easily. So this idea of having categories that then have us form factions, we're automatically going to be favoring some, favoring our in-group and disfavoring the out-group. Um, and something to keep in mind here is that this isn't something where we have to go out of our way to form these categories and form these factions. It happens automatically. You are automatically assigned to a faction. You're automatically labeled with a racial label, right? Whether you want to or not, that is how people see you and how other people categorize you. So we are immersed in this constantly and we really can't escape it. So with these factions that are triggering in-group loyalty uh, and uh, intergroup competition, right? So we're going to be favoring our in-group. We're also gonna be seeing the out-group as someone who's competing maybe for resources, or uh, or status or something like that, they're a threat to us. And so you're gonna be a little more negative towards them. And generally speaking, those sort of tensions, right? Where we have these different factors, us versus them, that gets heightened the more you identify with your in-group. So that minimal groups paradigm where it's like, oh, I saw more dots than you did, or I thought I saw more dots, that's pretty innocuous, right? But even that really, really weak identity can cause these effects. Um, you can have much stronger identities, right? So you can think of like, super fans for sports teams, right? They're very committed to that identity and they're going to defend that identity and have like even uh, more inflated views of their in-group that are more positive and more negative views of their out-group. Um, another really important factor is if people have very limited experience with the people who are members of the out-group or if the experiences they have had are pretty negative, then that's going to make those tensions like and, and like kind of turn them up even more. Right, because that limited experience you have or that negative experience you have isn't really doing much to disprove those beliefs that someone holds about the outgroup. Um, and then finally, groups that are in positions of high status tend to automatically see lower status groups as more threatening. Because if you're in a position of power, then you kind of have to look out for someone who might be looking to take that power from you or wants to reduce that power. And people in positions of power tend to like to keep that. Right. So if you're a high status group, that's kind of an automatic incentive to see the out group more negatively and see them as more threatening. And in the United States, uh, whites have been the high status group historically. Right. So that is something that exacerbates those sort of tensions. Uh, another example of this that you can find the sort of like the, the how easy it is to create factions 
is from uh, Muzaffar Sharif's Robbers Cave study. So this was done in kind of the 1950s. And uh, what Sharif did is he brought a, a bunch of, uh, oh, I think they were like 10 to 12 year old kids. Uh, they, they went to a, it was a Boy Scout camp and they brought them out. And initially they thought they were the only ones there and they're just, you know, doing camp stuff. Um, and then they find out that, oh wait, there's another group here. And they sort of see them at a distance. They don't really interact with them. And uh, these two groups then start competing, right? They, they set up competitions and they, they come up with names for themselves. So it's the, the Rattlers versus the Eagles, right? So you have this in-group, strong group identity and they participate in a tournament to win like really cool pocket knives, which were, I guess, all the rage for kids in the 50s. Um, and so they did activities like baseball and tug of war and they went and they, they raided each other's bunkhouses and stuff. So they really quickly amped up this sort of antagonism, right? Like they were, they were in opposition, they were competing. They were actually competing like for, for those knives, right? Like they have to win, like we got to win and that bands them together. Um, and from basically nothing, right? They didn't know these other kids, but they quickly started uh, nearly getting into kind of fist fights and stuff. And it didn't take, it literally took a couple days, right? But what's interesting from this study is that it also highlights that we have a way out of that, right? So this group antagonism, this hostility that was very easily created when those groups were interacting and competing, right? They were they were threats to each other's success. You're able to kind of turn that around um, by having them co cooperate and having some sort of bigger goal that they can all work towards as one in-group, as one one team. So uh, the examples here, uh, they had to cooperate uh, to to fix like the drinking water. They somehow stopped working at the camp where essentially like they jammed a rag in one of the faucets or something and the, they had to work together to find the problem and solve it. And so they were collaborating for this shared goal, right? And in many ways, that's that's sort of like positive intergroup contact. You're working together, you're solving problems. And that does a lot to diffuse those negative assumptions that we hold about members of the outgroup, right? You quickly realize like, oh, these aren't that terrible of people. And I've been basing this on these stereotypes and this prejudice that I just kind of internalized before that. Um, they also had to collaborate to like purchase a movie, right? At the time, like literal film reels that they would show. Um, but they uh, they were going to purchase the movie, and the camp director said, like, well, we can't afford that. You're going to have to pony up your own money if you if you want to do this. And the only way they could is if each team chose to contribute money uh, to also let the other team view the movie. And and they did, right? And this this really diffused those tensions and reduce that sort of hostility. And, and we see this in the real world, right? People, often people who have the, the strongest negative attitudes towards other groups don't actually have a lot of exposure to those other groups uh, and intentionally avoid interacting with those other groups. Um, so there's a couple other illustrations I have here. Um, I, I mentioned sort of sports teams, right? Where that's that's kind of this arbitrary thing that we, we experience, right? Like that's something we're exposed to. So in this example, uh, just thinking about pep rallies, right? It's completely arbitrary, uh, really amping up our, our attitudes to support our in-group, support our team, and like really kind of despise the other team, right? I know like the, the homecoming events that I had in high school were very much like that. And it's like, wait a minute, why do we hate the people from 40 miles down the road? Like, I'm not sure about this. But but in the comic, it's like, hey, like he's the best. Yeah, wait, what? Uh, hey, no, a guy on the football team helped me re rebuild my deck. Seems ungrateful to presume we're better. I mean, school districts are based just based on zip codes. It's arbitrary, right? The principal donated a kidney to my dad. Actually, I'm texting my friend there right now. He says it's okay, and we're invited to their event if we want, but he sounded kind of hurt. Why are we doing this again? Like, this applies more broadly to the context that we see in society, right? These arbitrary divisions that just the fact that we have that division, that we have factions, turns it into this competition, this in-group, out-group, right? As long as we're seeing the world through that lens of in-groups and out-groups, this is sort of what you end up with. Uh, another good illustration, I appreciate this comic from Tom Gold, um, just sort of illustrating this, uh, well, in some ways, kind of like patriotism for anyone, for their country, right? So our country is wonderful. Our leader is great and our, our religious beliefs are great and our people are noble uh, and our, our people going out into the world are heroes and adventurers. But the other people, right, the, the out group doing the just exactly the same thing, um, their leader is a despot, right? They're, they're authoritarian and they have their religious beliefs are superstitions. They're, they're savages compared to our noble population and they're brutish invaders, not adventurers, right? So it's, it's all about perspective. Um, and a lot of times these divisions are very arbitrary.
So we have these factions, we have these categories. Um, there are practical implications of this. And one of those that has a massive impact on people's experiences is segregation. So I mentioned that intergroup contact being really important for reducing that sort of hostility and getting people to realize, oh, my beliefs were inaccurate. I can change them. Um, but segregation prevents us from getting those experiences. It hardens those racist perceptions, those preferences and beliefs, because you don't get that intergroup contact. Um, a big example of this is redlining. So uh, redlining was uh, essentially a practice of designating certain areas, um, and typically these were areas uh, that were, were more predominantly uh, like black communities or Latino communities uh, as kind of poor investments, uh, right? So designating a neighborhood, that, that's a poor investment. And so we're not going to offer home loans to people who live in those neighborhoods, right? So this has the consequence of preventing communities of color from being able to purchase real estate. And real estate, especially over like the last hundred years and more, um, that is has been one of the biggest ways that families have built wealth, right? So if you have if you have parents who purchased a house for a hundred thousand dollars, like forty years ago, that house might be worth four hundred thousand dollars today. Through like you didn't really do anything to make that happen, just waited because things were cheap then. If you had access to it, now you have all this wealth that just kind of appeared, right? So redlining is an example of that. And if we don't have that interracial contact. It leads to us sort of narrowing our perceptions, right? If you literally don't have exposure to people who don't look like you, people genuinely are worse at distinguishing between people of other races when they don't have that intergroup contact. This has real world consequences if you're trying to choose someone out of a police lineup. If you are not very good at distinguishing between people who don't look like you, you're not going to be as reliable at making those distinctions and mistakes can be made. Uh, this can also lead children to develop preferences towards familiar groups, right? So if you don't get exposure to other groups, you're going to prefer what you're comfortable with. And if what you're comfortable with is only people that look like you, that's going to get perpetuated. Uh, this can promote beliefs that interracial relationships are undesirable. So if you are living in segregation, right, the status quo is this division, this divide, and that implicitly tells you it's not okay for you to have interracial relationships. That kind of gets absorbed, right? Kids are, are like sponges. They absorb everything around you, uh, around them. And like they notice these things, whether consciously or not, but we notice them and we have an idea of what's normal, what's standard, what's expected and what's not, right? Or what is um, kind of punished in society. So uh, not sure how well you'll be able to see this, but this is actually based on our census data from 2010, kind of the most recent that's that's out at this point. But uh, this is Springfield. So the blue dots are uh, census codes where there is a white individual. The uh, black population is the green dots. Asian population is red and Hispanic population is orange. And you can see, like in our community, there's clearly segregation that exists. And I mentioned redlining. Right. This idea that certain communities or certain areas or neighborhoods were designated as we're, we're not going to offer home loans. Right. And they tended to correspond with communities uh, of color in many ways. Well, this is the actual map of those real estate designations in Springfield, Ohio. This is from 1934. And what you'll notice is a lot of those literal red areas, the areas that were redlined, correspond to the areas uh, where there are more prominent communities of color to this day in Springfield. Right? So it has these long term consequences. But of course, this happens in other cities as well. Uh, this is Chicago. Chicago is an incredibly diverse city. But it's also an incredibly segregated city. Right. So when we talk about things in terms of diversity, it's important to think about, well, what what does that diversity look like on the ground in terms of thinking about racism? Are people experiencing like positive intergroup interracial contact? And in Chicago, the segregation is very defined and very clear, right? So that's going to be a problem if you're trying to get that positive intergroup contact because the, the people who don't look like you might be literally miles away on the other side of the city. Right? And then at a national scale, you can see pretty clear segregation too, right? Just very broadly speaking. Um, so uh, we have a lot of the larger communities, uh, black communities are in the deep south, right? Uh, a lot of Hispanic communities are going to be in south, southwest. 
Um, but so like where I grew up in North Dakota uh, is a very white area, right? And that's just a fact of, of the geography that we have uh, and a consequence of years and centuries of segregation and practices that promote that. So segregation is a problem because if our goal is to reduce racism, it's preventing us from doing that because positive intergroup contact is one of the most powerful things we have to change people's minds and change their perceptions. Uh, our next big factor is hierarchy, right? So we're thinking about these factions, we're thinking about segregation. So we have these different groups in people's minds, right? They're very well enforced, but they're not just different groups. They're also at different levels in society, right? There is a hierarchy that exists. And when that hierarchy exists, it basically emboldens people to enforce or continue uh, pursuing the sort of status quo of that hierarchy. And in this case, there is a racial hierarchy that exists in the United States where white Americans are disproportionately at those positions of power, right? They are higher in this hierarchy by default. Um, and so we see that white Americans disproportionately occupy high status positions in society. We see that they're more readily granted this title of American. It's often denied to Americans of color, right? So like people, like you're not really American or like you're not a true American. When we say true American, often what people are thinking or seeing in their mind is a white American, right? And that's that's a consequence of this sort of hierarchy. So uh, sample size is relatively small, but you're probably aware that about 2% of United States presidents have been non-white. That's uh, That is disproportionate. That is the highest position of power in our executive branch of the government, right? We see this hierarchy in wealth. There is a massive wealth gap between white and black populations in the United States. So uh, where in, so in 2016, the uh, average wealth of a typical black family was about $16,000. Uh, the same for a white family was $163,000. And this, there are so many factors that go into this, but like we mentioned before, redlining is a good example, right? If you, your family, uh, generations ago wasn't able to invest in like real estate, which is like an easy automatic way, or at least it has been over the past century to increase your wealth, then you miss out on that, right? You're not going to see that increase in wealth that was only really available to white populations, right? Uh, in that context. And we also see uh, organizations that are very strongly trying to enforce these hierarchies. Right, so the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, in 2019 tracked 940 hate groups. Right, these hate groups are very clearly trying to maintain a hierarchy or enforce a hierarchy uh, of status. Right, very explicitly saying groups of a particular designation are better and more valued than other groups. So this is this is an ongoing and enduring problem. So we have this hierarchy. Right. This is going to embolden people to think in these ways. Um, and it's important to think about how this affects children as well. Right. So children, like I said, they're, they're sponges. Right. They soak up everything and uh, kind of absorb the environment. And if the environment is racist, they're going to absorb that. Uh, and sort of the automatic way that children do this is they recognize the hierarchy. We, we notice who's in charge. We notice who's respected. We notice who's in positions of power. And the trouble here comes from uh, something we, we call like the fundamental attribution error, where we're thinking about like why someone like has particular characteristics or why they did something in particular or why, uh, why someone is successful. And we tend to assume or make the assumption that the reason someone is successful, the reason someone has a lot of money, the reason they're in a position of power has to do somewhat with like has something to do with who they are has to do with their disposition. They're hardworking, they're smart, they're, they're dominant, they're, they're like a good leader. We make those assumptions, they might not be true. Turns out, uh, in a lot of cases, things come down to luck, right? Or if we're thinking about the sort of systemic or structural racism, it comes down to the structures, right? Historical events, uh, systems of oppression, things like we mentioned redlining. That is something that affects some people and not others. So those are things we don't tend to automatically think about. Right? You have to be intentional to sort of consider these broader structures because normally we don't pay much attention to them. Uh, and children sort of make the assumption of if you're in these positions of power, it must be something about you. Right? They don't really think about those structures or these bigger uh, things that may be outside of our control that may have led to the way things are. And uh, we also are exposed to a lot of ideologies, right? these sort of belief systems that reinforce 
these sort of hierarchies. So there's a few interesting examples. Um, one that you're probably familiar with is this notion of the Protestant work ethic, right? So th this notion that like, if you work hard, you'll succeed, right? So like pick yourself up by your bootstraps, which is, it can be inspiring. And it's like, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna put my nose to the grindstone. I'm really gonna work and I'm gonna, I'll succeed eventually, right? But that also really emphasizes those dispositions, right? Where it just comes down to you, right? And if you're not succeeding, you just must not be working hard enough. And it really ignores the system that exists or the context that you find yourself in. So succeeding, success is harder for some people than for others through no fault of their own, right? So just that notion of this Protestant work ethic, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, really ignores and dismisses these other factors. And it's uh, sort of like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer kind of mentality. Because if you're in a position that makes things easier for you to accomplish, you're gonna continue to be able to accomplish those things, right? And if things are difficult for you, it's gonna continue to be difficult. Uh, hypo descent is a historical uh, ideology, sort of belief system that has consequences today, right? So this is the notion of when we're determining what category someone might belong to in terms of racial categories, this is uh, the idea of like the one drop rule. If someone has one drop of like non-white blood, now they're no longer white. They're no longer part of that white in-group and now they're part of the out-group, right? And that has this function of very strictly enforcing that hierarchy, right? Uh, and we mentioned sort of segregation as inhibiting uh, sort of like interracial relationships. Well, this belief system also serves that function, right? It is uh, like telling people like, hey, if you are white and you're a part of this, the dominant group, you're getting kicked out if you decide to have a relationship with someone who's not part of our in-group, right? And this is something that still persists, even if not in law, because this was legally legislated in the past, it still persists psychologically, right? In the way we people automatically categorize whether someone is black or white, uh, those are things that there are very uh, fierce conversations about, right? Whether someone should or is identified in a particular way. Uh, and finally, the notion of, of God, literally God being white, came about and became more widespread after black Americans were granted full citizenship, right? Because then there, that sort of that uh, hierarchy began to get a little more blurred, right? So that's the high status became a little more threatened for white Americans and this, reinforces this belief that like literally whites are closer to God than blacks, right? And if you're going to reinforce a hierarchy, that's that's a pretty powerful way to try to do that. And speaking about power, power is our number five characteristic. So power is uh, essentially the ability to make decisions and make determinations and legislate racism and ra practices that promote racism, uh, both on the micro and macro level. So we'll talk about what that means in a second. But if we think about the high status positions that white Americans have been able to maintain throughout history of the United States, that social status and that social power has allowed them to establish social norms. So this can be things uh, just as simple as like what accents are standard, right? Uh, so like African American uh, English is uh, for many people considered to be like an inferior form of English, even though it's, it's just another variation of a language, right? There's nothing inherently like better or worse about any particular language. So uh, accents that are designated to be lower status or lower class, who's allowed to participate in political elections, right? Who's allowed to vote to determine who's in power? Uh, powers allowed people to achieve their goals, right? So uh, there's a history of many different forms of, of testing potentially being uh, biased and racially biased where, um, uh, so like a good example of this, if I were to ask you, like uh, a list of things and like name three things that you would need to use in a sailing regatta. Well, if I don't have experience with sailing, how would I know that, right? That's a weird question. And so that same sort of thing had historically been used for different uh, assessments and different tests where if you ask questions that a particular group has no reason to know the answers for, of course, they're going to do poorly on those tests. And if that test is necessary in order for them to be able to vote, that provides a mechanism to deny the right to vote to those people. Uh, being able to give orders, right, and sort of legislate, this is how we're gonna teach English. This is what we're gonna teach in our history classes, right? That has a lot of impact on shaping the way people see things. Being able to control resources, right? Funding different schools. So uh, thinking back to like separate but equal, um, 
it was never really equal, right, in terms of education. When some schools get much more resources than others, of course, that's going to have an impact on people. Uh, and finally, being able to dominate and exploit others, right? So where, where do we decide to put our hazardous waste landfills? And, or uh, like, where do we put like kind of high risk things or, or uh, anything that someone doesn't want in their backyard, right? The not in my backyard sort of argument. Well, that usually ends up going in places that are already um, being kind of disenfranchised, that are at lower positions of power because they don't have the political capital or like social status to make those decisions or to influence those decisions that are being made. So a few examples uh, where we see this disparity in power in some ways, or at least consequences of that, something that we're unfortunately quite familiar with from the past couple of years, black Americans are uh, about 2.5 times more likely than whites to be killed by police. Like this is just, this is a statistical fact, right? Uh, exactly why this is the case is something that's very tricky to disentangle. But the fact that as a black American, you are much more likely to be killed by police kind of shows that the, there is this hierarchy. There's there's something that's causing that, right? Um, so that sort of demonstrates that there is a difference that exists between these groups. Uh, another example, uh, looking at equity risk factors. So what this is kind of plotting is uh, essentially the number of times a county is on the list of the top counties for poverty rates, so high poverty rate counties, um, having people who need to live in multi-generational households, so sort of not by choice, but like me and my parents and their parents all have to live in the same household so that we're kind of overcrowded and the difficulties and challenges that come with that. Um, and also the gap in white and black life expectancy, right? Where just the fact that someone is black means that their life expectancy is substantially lower in these areas. So uh, this map kind of illustrates, like you see that these equity risk factors uh, are in the deep south. Uh, you see like a big impact that people are experiencing there. Another very relevant issue today, um, there's a lot of implications for healthcare, but with COVID, there's a very recent epidemiological study that was released um, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on black communities. And we know that uh, COVID-19 has been hitting uh, sort of black and Hispanic communities harder than it hits white communities due to different access to, to healthcare uh, and other resources or being maybe being unable to take time off from work, uh, all of those sort of things. But what we see is that the counties um, that are seeing uh, like the highest levels of diagnoses are disproportionately black. Like you're more likely to get COVID-19 in these disproportionately black, black counties. Um, also, the counties that are disproportionately seeing deaths uh, uh, associated with COVID-19 tend to be those disproportionately black counties, right? So there are real health implications that we see here. So I mentioned uh, we talked about that micro and macro level of power. Um, so at the micro level, right, so sort of like at the very immediate close level, parents have a lot of power in shaping what their children believe, right? They can deny them that intergroup contact. They can directly transmit beliefs that perpetuate like racist attitudes and stuff. Um, that has a very powerful influence on children, right? Because children, children soak up everything, but they only soak up what they're exposed to. Uh, and then at the big picture level, the macro level, uh, people who are in positions of leadership. We know that uh, if someone in a position of power, uh, either through inaction or like direct action, sort of signals that certain behaviors or certain beliefs are acceptable or encouraged, that will tend to make those beliefs more common, right, among the population. We look to our leaders for leadership and they can lead us in different directions. And as an illustration of this sort of micro level, Right, maybe a more extreme illustration of this micro level of the role that parents play in sort of shaping the beliefs of their children. You can look at this picture, right? I hazard a guess that that child doesn't fully understand the ideology that they may be getting exposed to in the KKK, but yet you can be brought up to believe that ideology. And that may be the only thing that you really are exposed to. And that can get very firmly ingrained in people's understanding of how the world works is the media. So uh, the media tends to legitimize uh, overrepresented and idealized representations of white Americans, right? So this association of like white being good and, and powerful and high positions of, of power in the hierarchy uh, while marginalizing and minimizing people of color. 
So um, a powerful example of this uh, is actually uh, Native Americans, right? So Native Americans um, are typically portrayed in, in media, in many forms of media, as kind of historical or, or kind of outdated figures. So ideas of like warrior, warrior chiefs and princesses, um, sort of this notion of being outside of regular society, which is not reflective of the Native American population at all, right? So perpetuating that sort of belief of they're, well, they're clearly part of the outgroup is going to facilitate those sort of uh, racist beliefs, right? Because we know what happens when we think of ourselves as being part of the in-group and uh, kind of understand who the outgroup is and see them more negatively, right? See them as more of competition and all the things that go along with that. You also see this in other ways in the media. So uh, this, this chart kind of illustrates uh, from a big survey that minorities are more likely to believe there are a few authentic characters of their own race. And if you keep an eye out, like if you watch the shows that you watch, like just take a moment to think about if there's someone there uh, who, like if there is a black character, if there's a Hispanic character, um, to what extent is their race used as a key part of their identity? Or are they just represented as another character, right? and like they have other character qualities that go beyond just their racial identity. And in general, uh, the black and Hispanic population surveyed uh, very clearly reported that there weren't a lot of black authentic characters for the black population that participated in the survey. And Hispanic uh, participants said that there weren't a lot of authentic Hispanic characters in, in media. See, uh, just within representation of like black Americans on TV, that uh, there's a strong sense that there's, even within that, a preference for lighter skinned actors to be given uh, more jobs, right? To appear more in media. And that is already sort of emphasizing this notion of like white skin being more desirable and better, right? And uh, more positive. Um, and so this is something that, that you see, and this is generally supported, right? Uh, so if you, if you look at media, uh, that is, an, a historical association that exists out there. So you can keep an eye out for this when you're looking at media yourself. Uh, another example is in media reporting of crime. So there was a, a big study of how news agencies in New York City presented crime on their networks and the extent to which it actually reflected who was committing the crime. And in every case for murder, theft, and assault here, uh, Black Americans were overrepresented the news articles, the news stories that were talking about the crime in the city were vastly overrepresenting how many criminals were actually black in these cases, right? And if the information we're getting is telling us and is associating criminality with something like black skin, then we pick up on that, right? You kind of absorb that. Uh, and it isn't even accurate, right? So it's not even an accurate representation of what is really occurring. Also how people are described in the news media can have a big impact. So these are just a couple examples, but for a white suspect, the report that is uh, saying that they were arrested says straight A student plots to bomb high school. Um, so that's an odd thing to mention, right? That they're a straight A student. Uh, it's a very kind of positive characteristic, but for this white suspect, that's what gets mentioned specifically. That's what the newspaper decided the readers needed to know. And for not just a, a black suspect, but a black victim who was the victim of a crime, more negative characteristics tend to be associated or brought up. So the shooting victim had many run-ins with the law. That still doesn't justify that they were shot, right? But that is what the media decided is the most important thing to mention. Um, another uh, kind of telling example, this uh, is two articles that were posted uh, at this uh, online newspaper. Uh, these events occurred on the same day. It was the same crime, burglary. It was the same news station. Uh, for the white individuals, they used their university pictures. Uh, and for the black individuals, they used the police mugshots, right? And so some agencies, I think San Diego, has stopped releasing mugshots um, due to racial bias, right? So if just regardless of whether someone's guilty or not, if uh, black people in the community are being arrested more often, and all the mugshots are being released, that is misrepresenting like whether someone actually committed the crime, right? So they, they decide to stop even releasing mugshots for everyone who was arrested. Um, another example, uh, so this case is actually still ongoing, uh, 
Um, so if you just see this headline, a clean cut American kid suspected of race murders, you probably have an idea of what race this individual might be. And of course, like this is the description of a white individual. Um, so the media, psychology is also studied kind of other ways the media can influence us. There's a classic study by Albert Bandura called kind of the Bobo doll study. And in this study, they essentially found around the time when TV was really getting into more households and they're like, hey, wait a minute, how is this going to influence our children? How is this going to have an effect on them? So what they did is they had uh, these children watch videos of an adult who went into a room and just kind of interacted with some stuff, didn't really do anything out of the ordinary or they had them watch a video of an adult who went in the room and really beat up this doll, like this inflatable clown doll, the Bobo doll, and throw it around the room, hit it with a hammer, all kinds of stuff. And of course, what they found is after children watch that and then you let them go into the room, the ones that watched the adult be violent with the doll were also violent with the doll, right? Children observe what we do. And if you're paying attention to what's going on around you, you you see what gets rewarded, you see what gets punished, you see what people can do and like not have negative consequences. And you kind of get a sense of what the norms are, what's expected, and your behavior reflects that. Uh, luckily, they also found that if the person, uh, the adult who was attacking the doll was scolded and got in trouble, then they were the children were less likely to do it, right? Because you see like, oh, that's a bad thing. And you learn that as well. But if we're exposing people to media that tells them, no, this is okay, this is acceptable, that's going to be what they internalize. Um, and then finally, perhaps one of the most uh, insidious aspects that's promoting racism is passivism, right? This notion that we're not doing anything about something that we clearly know exists and is clearly causing problems that maybe we don't agree with, but we're not doing anything about it. And that, that idea of like overlooking or denying this existence of racism makes it harder to see the reality of what's really happening out in the world. It encourages others to do the same. Uh, and it allows racism to fester and persist. So there's a few ways this can happen. One is through ignorance. Uh, and there's actually research that supports this pretty strongly that uh, a lot of white Americans don't really have a good historical account or understanding of racism in the United States, or it's been a very kind of watered down version of what has really happened. Uh, if you deny racism, that is going to reduce us from wanting to do anything about it, right? If someone says, well, that doesn't really exist, of course, they're not going to be motivated to do anything about it. Um, and this is going to reduce support for policies like affirmative action or redistribution of wealth or, or anything to sort of intentionally address an issue. If you don't think it's an issue, you're not going to be interested in pursuing that. And finally, if we just see other people not doing anything, that makes us more likely to not do anything. Uh, so you've maybe heard of the bystander effect where a bunch of people might be standing around and there's someone who's in need of help, but if no one is doing anything, then everyone else kind of assumes like, oh, I guess maybe it's not really a big problem or they'll be fine. Like surely all these other people would care if it was this was something we needed to pay attention to. So if we observe other people not doing anything, that makes us less likely to do something. And then finally, I want to end on just sort of this metaphor of thinking about this sort of systems uh, of racism that exist and this notion of uh, being passively racist, right? So we've talked about all these categories and the hierarchy and the power systems and all these structures that perpetuate racism in the United States, um, it's important to realize that that goes on whether or not you do anything about it, right? So if you just decide, well, you know what? I'm not going to be racist from this day forward. That's great. But you're also not doing anything to prevent or reduce or stop these racist systems from continuing into the future. And if we look at the history of the United States, they have clearly continued from the beginning of this country. They're still here. They're still being perpetuated. So this is where the notion of being anti-racist and actually going preemptively and trying to do things to reduce racism or think about yourself and your life, like what are you doing to address these sort of issues actively is really important. So you can think of it as sort of like a moving sidewalk, right? Like in the airport, if you just stand on that sidewalk, that's kind of like, I'm not going to do anything racist. But the sidewalk is still moving, right? Society is still having these factors that contribute to racism. And unless we sort of walk in the opposite direction, we're not really doing much to change things and make them better. And that brings us to the end. It is just about 12.50. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this talk. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. But if anyone has any questions you'd like to ask, I will stick around for a little bit.
All right. Thanks again, everybody.